All right, guys, welcome back to the Couch Scouts with Sean and JP from Pick 6. And this week we got a special guest, former Oakland Raider, Stanford Route. Stanford, I did not know you owned the 40-yard dash record prior to uh, Chris Johnson breaking it. I had no idea when I looked up your Wikipedia page, you know, because Wikipedia has all the facts, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I did wrong. not know that. That was crazy to me. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, I broke it back in 05 with the Combine. I, and Chris broke it, I think, 08, something like that. And, uh, yeah, he was class of 08. Yeah, yeah, class of 08. And, uh, but, like, I still – from what I understand, I think I still have it for, like, DBs or, like, for defensive players or some weird – some weird stat like that. But, uh, yeah, no, nah, I still remember Chris Johnson breaking it. And then it was Dre Archer, I think, maybe ran faster. And then I think uh, – my man from Cincinnati, uh, uh, receiver, uh, John Ross. John Ross, yeah, yeah, John Ross. John Ross, but uh, but no, nah, man, that's a fun time, fun time. Did so when you crossed the finish line? Did they hand you the Raiders jersey there, or did they tell you to go to the front <laughs> desk and pick man. it up? <laughs> man, you know, uh, I did not hear anything from the Raiders the entire draft process or anything like that. Um, I knew that. Uh, I knew that it was the Broncos actually and it was the Titans from what I was hearing were probably taking them um somewhere like second round anywhere I think I was supposed to slate it anywhere between 20 to 40 somewhere in that area and in my pro day Clayton Lopez the DB coach at the time for the Raiders back then uh he ran me through some workout drills during the pro day uh but I like I said I didn't think anything of it because there's a lot of other teams there as well so uh, once I got drafted and that first mini camp right after the draft, that's when Calvin Branch, he told me, he's like, Ralph, I could have told you at y'all at your pro day that we were going to take you. But, you know, I had to keep it uh, – I had to keep everything uniform. But, uh, but yeah, fun times, man. It's so – it's crazy because so many players – and I remember Fabian, he didn't hear anything from the Raiders either. So, uh, so oftentimes you'll be drafted by the team that essentially, like, you hear nothing from out of nowhere. Yeah, like just like it just comes out of nowhere. So yeah, I've uh I've known of several players that have uh that have had that same type of experience. That's funny. So, so I, I looked it up here. You are the fastest defender still. Oh wow. We got John Ross, Chris Johnson, Dre Archer, Jerome Mathis, mm, Marquise yeah. Goodwin, and then you. Yeah, Jay Mathis, man. Me and him used to go ahead on the track back in college, also in the two hundred. Yeah, man, that uh, that brings back a lot of memories, man. But hey, well, still fastest defense player. I'll take it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Quick little shout out to Fabe too. Fabe's not far down that list. Yeah, yeah, no, man, my boy, man, Fabe. I still remember at the combine after we all did our workout, uh, we all kind of gathered together, our group, and then they kind of you know say the times or whatever. Yes, yeah, so mine was four two seven. I think Fabe was four two nine, four two eight, something in that four two. Not range. too far off. But uh, but nah, man, nah, me and him, man. I remember we were actually on the same flight. Uh, I had a layover in Atlanta, and he was, I guess, flying straight out of Florida or whatever. But we were on the same flight going to the combine uh, in Indy, man. Yeah. Do you? I know Chris Johnson last year. He went on. I think um, that guy from Bleach Report. I forget his name. He went on his show. And Adam Lefko. Oh, Adam Lefko. And he still claims that the 40 yard time was rigged, that that John Ross did not run faster than him at the <laughs> and and the side by side kinda I, I kind of believe him. Don't you that love those side by sides that they do every year? Yeah. yeah. Like <laughs> I was like kind of like maybe he's right. Like, do you think maybe every like couple of years, like we need to boost up the excitement? Let's see if this guy like will make it seem like he ran faster than the previous guy. Now, it's funny that you say that because not because of John Ross, not because of him, but for me, running track all throughout my life and even in college, I know what speed looks like. Like, I, I, like somebody can run. I don't even need a time or a, like a clock or whatever. And I can tell you, like, yeah, that guy's running fast because I can tell by the movement, the foot pattern, the stride, the gait, all of that. Now, not with John Ross, but there was a DB that I'm not going to say his name, but there was a DB about seven years ago. He ran like a 4-3. And I remember me and my homeboy sitting there watching. He's like, Stan, that's not a 4-3. Um, so for what Chris Johnson said, there might be some validity to it. There might be. 
uh, because I felt like that when I see certain guys run, not John Ross, because when I saw John Ross run, it looked fast. Now, yeah, was yeah. it a four two two? Was it really maybe a four two five? Man, I don't know, and I really don't care. I know it was fast though. Uh, but to what Chris Johnson said, I would uh, I'd be lying if I said that there aren't times where I felt the same thing, but just not about John Ross's though. Well, I know Damian Arnett this past year, they um he he got clocked at like two seconds slower than he or point two seconds slower than he actually like Mayock said he had him faster than he was, and some guys had him like another point two or three seconds off. Like how do, how is there such a dispar- uh, discrepancy between those times? Because for one, and I'm pretty sure that the combine is still ran the same way that it was back when I was there. From what I remember. First of all, it's not, it's not fully electronic timing as much as they try to go in uh, and try to publicize it. It's not. Say it's all lasers and stuff. Exactly. Because what happens is uh, it is the start is done, I think, electronically. But the finish – no, I'm sorry. It's, the start is done, by, uh, is done by hand, and then the finish line is electronic. Guys, oh. I ran, I, I've run track my entire life, and fully electronic, fully automatic timing is from the beginning to the end. There isn't any hand time anywhere in that operation. Yeah, because that, that's and, a lot of room for error, just even, even that little button press. Ex- exactly. So, yeah, so obviously they try to go ahead and promote electronic timing, but it's not the fully automatic timing that you see at a track meet, simply because that's also one of the reasons why at a track meet, you see the guys have that uh, that number on their hip. Yeah, That's why, because there's a little chip in there. And so whenever you cross the finish line, that laser picks up that chip that's on that, uh, on that number that's right there on your hip. Right. A, lot, a lot of people don't realize that. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's, not, fully, uh, it's not fully electronic time at the combine. It's not. And then also I can tell you like this, if you're already predisposed to liking a certain player, or you're not. The guys up there, the GM, the head coach, everybody's sitting up in the stands. They got their own stopwatch anyways. Yeah. yeah. So they'll, they'll, they might a, shave a few tents off. Exactly. So if it's a player that you like because you really liked what he did on his game film at Florida or USC, Oklahoma, whatever, if you already liked him as a player and the official time is 448, but you had him at 442, well, you already like the player, so you're going to go ahead and go with your 4-4-2 because, man, I already like him anyways. Yeah. But, yeah. If, but if it's a situation where, let's say it's a guy that, okay, my D coordinator really likes him and the, the, the GM like him, but I, but I got him at a 4-5-5. <laughs> and let's say his official time was 4-4-7. Well, you don't really like him much as a player because you didn't think he really played that fast on film. Uh, mm-hmm. Whenever you watched all the so games, you're, you're going to go with your time again. Yeah, exactly. Because you're already predisposed to not really liking him. So that's something that also goes on because you've got a lot of differences of opinion on a lot of players throughout the organization. The owner may like him. GM may not like him. GM may like him. Head coach may not like him. Head coach may like him. Offensive coordinator may mm-hmm. not like him. Things like that. Sounds like so, a lot of politics. <laughs> exactly. So, so you'll have several different people with a stopwatch that will go on the same guy. And like I said, us, 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 uh, us three right now, we can go right now and we can both put a clock on you same bolt. Well, all three have different times because 100%. my yeah. hand may, my hand may, may stop quicker than yours. Yours may be second in line and then yours may be third. Like, so, and then vice versa. So, uh, so no matter what, you're always going to have different, different uh, times on certain players. And then when you factor in your personal feelings, on that player that'll just go ahead and that'll uh, make you feel more steadfast in your time versus the official one or whatever. Hmm. Remember when dur- this is during the off season this past year, everybody, we went to the remote workouts and everything. Remember all those videos of the hand times and they were, yes. they were horrible. Exactly. The, the one might've been, I, it, don't quote me. It might've been Cam Dantzler, rookie corner from Minnesota. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, uh, he's fast. He, he is fast, but it, it, it was the timer on the video and you could like pause it and see the guy like press the button before he even crossed. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, we're going to see more of those this year. 
Yeah, I mean, guys, uh, you know, and I remember even back when I was in college, um, and for me running track is, you know, obviously I have a different level of appreciation for speed, time, things like that. So, you know, uh, the, the greatest thing about the combine is because in a lot of ways, it eliminates just what you're, what you're alluding to because I remember how at VTech, this is something that I heard, I don't know this for a fact, but I was always told that at VTech, when they do their pro day, when they run the 40, they run on a slight uh, incline. Where, it's, where you're actually going to have a faster time. And then those same guys that, let's say, ran like a 4-1 or something like that, will go to the combine, and they run like a 4-4, something like that. So mm. I think that uh, – so whenever you have the combine, it's such a level playing field um, that it really weeds out a lot of all of that ambiguity, a lot of all that confusion, because, you know, certain player ran a really good time at his pro day. And right. this guy right here ran a really good time with his uncle uh, having a stopwatch. So it just <laughs> it, it really levels that playing field because nobody has that advantage or anything like that. And then also, whenever you got a guy with a Trojan on his helmet, a Hurricane, a Longhorn, a Sooner, a Crimson Tide, a Buckeye, um, you always hear about, okay, he did X amount on the bench press or he did a really good vertical, things like that. But when everybody gets there in Indianapolis, the decal, the logo is off the helmet. You're not wearing a helmet. All you have is just DB. Number, 30, that's it. Exactly. DB 34. That's it. Yeah. There's no jersey that's got a Buckeye right here. It ain't no Crimson Tide right here. Ain't no Trojan. Ain't no nothing. So then it takes out the bias and everything is now just evaluated on, okay, you really ran a four six. You ran a fucking four six. Right. <laughs> if you really ran fast, but you came from Liberty or like <laughs> Coastal Carolina, you really ran fast. And and it takes all the bias out of it. So that's why you know the combine is great in a lot of ways because it weeds out all of that. I gotta ask you about the Raiders defense because the last time they were even what, what first- defense. Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, the last time they were even respectable was in 2010. They were 11th best. You were on that yeah. team. So I got to ask, like, is it the talent? Is it the coaching? Is it both? Is it, like, is Mayock not doing a great job selecting talent? Like, I, I don't understand. It's been 10 years, and they can't do anything. And it's, it just drives us crazy as Raider fans. I mean, and then on top of that, they traded away Khalil Mack. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, man, I think, I think there's multi-layers to that question. I think that – for one, I think in a lot of ways, the drafting probably has something to do with it, number one. Um, I love a lot of the talent that you see coming out in the draft, but I'll say this. Whenever you have guys that go to a school where they are just emphatically better than everybody else they play against, it's not as easy to evaluate them. Right. I, don't even, I don't even want to use any names, but I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to use a certain school. When you talk about Ohio State, they got, <laughs> glad you use that one. <laughs> they, got, they got DBs like – it's like a factory. Right. Yeah, for sure. But here's, the, but here's the thing about that. Ohio State is an SEC team playing in the Big Ten. The Big Ten, hey, man, you want running backs, offensive linemen, uh, guys in the trenches, linebackers, oh, my God. Go to the Big Ten because it's all about that cold weather, ground and pound, tough, in the trenches type of football. Now, you want guys on the edges? You're not going to find a bevy of talent in the Big Ten. Ohio State, you will. But in the Big Ten, you're not. So, with all that being said, at Ohio State, as far as their secondary, what stud receivers are they going against week to week to week in the Big Ten? They're not. So, when you look at that – and I go and I just throw this guy, oh, All-American. Oh, he's going to be first-round pick. Oh, that guy right there, Jim Thorpe Award winner. I'm not saying they're not good players. But for you to go ahead and automatically anoint them as being the cream of the crop, who are they playing this really stellar defense against? Are they so doing just looking it? at the results and not the competition. Are they, are they doing this against first-round talent receivers? Or are they just doing this against a Big Ten school that's in a Power Five conference? So you automatically assume, oh, they're balling out against Power Five schools, so they have to be good. 
So that's where I really think that you got to look deeper into that. But to get back to the question, I think that um, I think scheme also has something to do with it. And then I think accountability. Um, I remember how back, you know, in our years in Oakland, you know, we played a lot of man coverage. Well, I played alongside Nambi Asamoah. So like, man, like you better be on top of your shit because otherwise you're going to really, really look bad playing alongside Nambi Asamoah, much like playing opposite of Champ Bailey back at that same time. So I think that, uh, I think, I think uh, scheme probably has something to do with it because watching them down the stretch this past season, especially against the Chargers on the Thursday night game against the Miami Dolphins, the Saturday right after Christmas, which like that freaking just made me cry. <laughs> um, yeah, it's all I, I think, I think it's, I think it's a lot of that all balled into one. I think it's coaching. I think it's scheme. I think it's drafting. And then I think it's accountability uh, simply because certain mistakes you just have to make sure to clean up like as a corner if it's right before the half against justin herbert loves throw the ball down the field as a corner i got to get deeper after i sink into cover two and let them throw the check down to the running back but we got to guard the end zone if it's against the miami dolphins what how what was it 40 seconds left <laughs> yeah, like I, I gotta get I got to get a reroute on this receiver and I got to sink and safety. Like you got to get out of the freaking middle of the field or in your half. And you got to make sure that, okay, nothing gets behind me as the corner. I got to sink, let them throw the check down, but you can't let them put that ball right there in that honey pocket right there with they uh, and then on top of that with the face mask, with <laughs> 15 more yards on. So, I mean, Hey, I get it, you know, out there, like I'm not, I'm not gonna sit up and say like they're dogging it or they're not trying hard. Cause hey, man, we've all made our fair share yeah. of mistakes in life. I know I've made my fair share of mistakes on the field, things like that. So I'm not gonna completely condemn them. But I think uh, times like that, that's where coaching comes in, understanding the situation, understanding what the objective is on the field. And I think that at times, that's not something that was just imminently ingrained into everybody's mind because I even go back to the Kansas City Chiefs game Sunday night football to end the game <laughs> you got to know the situation you have to know the situation and you got to know who you're playing against so I think the man I think if they shore that up I think that man I think uh the Las Vegas Raiders man they got a bright future because with the offense the run game Darren Waller Derek Carr, my man in the uh, in the bag, Josh Jacobs, man, like the offense, they're gonna do their part, but the defense, the defense got to come along, has to come along. <laughs> but I got out of that between Ohio State and you talking about the cover two plays. Not a big fan of Damian Arnett. <laughs> no, uh, like, and no, and, and the thing is, is that I'm of this mindset, and this is not just Ohio State. Hear me very clearly. When you have a team and you're having two players from the same position drafted in the first round. I'll use Iowa. You had Noah Fant and then Hawkinson drafted to the uh, Detroit Lions. That's really hard to do in both of them be studs. Yeah. I feel That's like really, really hard. it shouldn't happen. Ex <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So what yeah. I'm saying is that oftentimes when I see a team in college football, and they got two guys drafting the first round at that position. I'm thinking one of those guys may not be as good as advertised. That's what okay. I'm, I'm usually so, thinking. Doesn't so who's not happen? as good as advertised, Jerry Judy or Henry Ruggs? Oh, uh -huh, here we go. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh. Okay, now that's a whole nother topic, but I, I'll dive into that. Uh, I like Judy, man. He, I like, uh, and I did not realize as fast as he's as fast as he is. like that long run he had last did, week sean did i not tell you that the other day i was like i, was I never like, realized he's that fast I, was like, yeah, I didn't realize right. he was that fast but i mean hey i love i love his route running i love all that uh now as far as henry rugg i i love him being in the position he's in for the raiders because he's to take the top off the defense guy now i'll say this i think jerry judy is probably more ready to go in and be the number one guy right now even though y'all have, even though y'all have uh, my man uh, Cortland Sutton, stud player from state of Texas, so I ride with all those guys. Um, I think Ruggs, because he's a faster player, I think he's gonna have to learn to actually increase his usage of all the routes on the route tree. When he does that, he's gonna be extremely effective. Once he does it, now we know Judy. 
great routes at University of Alabama and did that for the Denver Broncos. I think that if Corbin Sutton doesn't get hurt and my man uh, Drew Locke doesn't get hurt, I had Drew Locke picked to be actually like an MVP candidate this year because I thought he was going to have Sutton and, you know, everything like that. But I think for Jerry Drew, uh, I think for, uh, for Ruggs, and this is something I had to learn throughout my early years and especially in college, is that whenever you're a faster player, football is not about who's the fastest. Football is about who's the fastest under control. So a guy that runs a 4-2-40, if he's not able to control it, he'll never be as successful as the 4-4 guy who can run it under control. Jerry Judy, Odell Beckham, Antonio Brown's only about a, four, a high 4-4, but Antonio Brown runs that same 4-4 in his dig, in his mm -hmm. comeback, in his skinny post. He runs a 4-4 in his route where he doesn't have to slow down, stop, gather himself, things like that. So I think that uh, – I think for Ruggs, man, I love what he did this year because he brings a different element to the game, and that actually helped out Derek Carr. But I think that once Ruggs learns to actually use the other routes on the route tree to set up the deep ball, much like how Randy Moss used, uh, used to, I think that once he does that, I think Ruggs is going to really be a top guy in this league because he brings a different dimension to the game. For the longest time all season, Sean and I, and it started to happen at the end, but Sean and I would be like, I'd ask Sean, I'd be like, why aren't you guys getting Ruggs more involved? And then he'd ask me, why aren't we getting Judy more involved? And I'm like, I don't know. I'd <laughs> Mystery. Every week. I'd be like, oh, look, Ruggs saw three targets and Judy saw two. Oh, okay. This, because This is great. But, and, and this is where once you get to the league, this is where things change as a player. Because I'll use myself as an example. And I remember Moss told me this in my rookie year. He said, Ralph, the guys who are going to give you trouble in this league are the big guys who can run. I think Ruggs is like 5'11", I'm assuming six foot maybe, mm. something like that. I'm not sure. Um, but if it's a player who's not my high – I was 6'1". If it's a player who's not taller than me, that doesn't really bring much fear into my eyes. It really, really doesn't. Now, the tall guys – the Malcolm Floyd, the Vincent Jackson, the uh, who was it? Uh, the Randy Moss, the uh, who was another one? Calvin Johnson. Um, yeah, Calvin Johnson. Those guys. Oh my lord! You better be ready to play that Sunday. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> but if it was somebody that wasn't taller than me, I wasn't really worried about them beating me because if he because even if he's a fast guy, because I'm taller. When we're running down the field on this nine route, if he's if he's six foot or five eleven or five ten. The quarterback's not going to be able to see him 40 yards down the field, just like why Richard Sherman is so good or Jalen Ramsey, because they tower over the receiver. But if it's Julio Jones, who's 6'3", or an A.J. Green, who's 6'4", or a Mike Evans, and they see that, okay, my receiver is just as tall as that DB, I'm going to go ahead and put it up there and trust that, you know what, he'll come down with a 50-50 ball, or like Cortland Sutton, because that brings a different element to the game. So I think for Henry, for, uh, for Ruggs, because everybody knows, okay, he's fast, he likes to run deep. DBs know that. I remember back in 2010, I remember we were playing the Pittsburgh Steelers, the year that they lost in the Super Bowl to the Green Bay Packers. I remember Speedy, our, our D-back coach at the time, he told us, he said, guys, 17 is really fast. He said, guys, stay on top of him all day. Give him the hitch, give him the comeback, give him whatever. Stay on top of him. Don't let him get on top of you. So going into that game, I remember I was matching on Mike Wallace for much of the game, but I never let him get on top of me. Never did. Catch the hitch, catch the comeback, do whatever you want, dog, but you're not getting on top of me because that wasn't part of his game. The hitch, the comeback, the dig, that wasn't part of his game. He likes to take the top off the defense. So for a lot of teams, they know going into this game, we're not giving you the deep ball. We're not giving it to you. You can catch the underneath, you can do whatever, but we're not going to give you the deep ball. So I think that whenever you ask that question, man, why is Ruggs not more involved for that game? They may have been going against a team that simply had the mindset, hey, um, he's not beating us. They're just not going to let him. Exactly. Yeah. That Well, that also explains, like, this year, I know Tyreek Hill had a great year, but it felt mm -hmm. like he had way less explosive plays than he usually does. Like, I mean, he That's still was. Not. But that's – yeah, I think a lot of teams just were like, yeah, we're just going to let you run underneath because we're not letting you beat us over the top. Because a lot of times – and and I learned this probably toward my, the latter part of my career, and this is why Tom Brady is so great. Most teams – and this is why you saw the 
the Raiders were the only team this year to actually give the Chiefs problems. It really worked the first time at Arrowhead, not so much the second time when they played out there at Allegiant Stadium, even though it sh- they should have won the goddamn game if they didn't <laughs> F up the last series. But most teams, most quarterbacks do not have the focus and they don't have the maturity level to go down the field, 12-play, 80-yard drive. They yeah. don't. Without having a drop pass, a holding call, a false start, some sort of miscommunication between the receiver and the quarterback, something like that. They don't have that level of patience. They don't. Most teams don't because guess what? Most quarterbacks want to do what? You want to get that 50-yard bomb touchdown. They want, they they want to be on Sports Center top 10. Exactly. They want to show off their arm. They want to throw that deep dig across the middle. They want to throw that post pattern. Most quarterbacks. Now, there's one quarterback who's perfectly fine with throwing check downs all the goddamn way <laughs> to the end zone. And that guy right there has six Super Bowl rings. TB12. Outside of him, most guys don't do it. You guys remember back when the 49ers were really, really balling with – Vic Fangio Alex. as a D coordinator when Jim Harbaugh was there. Alex Smith? Uh, oh. Yeah, and, 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 and Kaepernick. Kaepernick, yeah. 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 And, they, and they used to smack Green Bay every <laughs> Every evening. time. <laughs> and it's because with Jordy Nelson, Driver, James Jones, all those guys, Aaron Rodgers, as much as I love him, 05 draft class, Aaron Rodgers likes to throw downfield. So the 49ers had – my man Carlos Rogers came out of my draft class. They had my man Terrell Brown. They had Deshaun Goldson, and they had Dante uh, Dante Whitley. And but guess what? They had Hall of Famer uh, uh, Patrick Willis, uh, Patrick Willis uh, right there inside backer. And then yeah, Navarro Bowman, Navarro Bowman, backer. the one that everyone always forgets about. Exactly. Mm. And then they had that pass rush with Alden Smith, Brooks, Justin Smith, all those guys. So all they would do is they would run quarters. And they would sit those linebackers back 10 to 12 yards. And what that does, it, it takes away that deep shot. And the safeties and the corners are all playing everything top down. So now A-Rod has to throw the eight-yard curl. Okay, they get up, they make the tackle, second and two. Okay, they're still able to move the ball, but they're not able to get those chunk plays. And, then, oh, yeah, by the way, while he's trying to find Jordy Nelson going on the seam or James Jones uh, going down the seam, oh, yeah, Alden Smith is over there about to sack him. (laughs) So that's why, like I said, man, most teams, they don't have the patience to go all the way down the field, throwing the check down, throwing the shorter pass. Just take what the defense gives you. Exactly. But most teams are not equipped to do that mentally because that's hard. Because if I want to throw this eight-yard curl, offensive line has to protect. The offensive tackle has to make sure that he doesn't allow the DN to get his hands up. The receiver has to run his pattern at eight yards. Everything has to be on time. He's got to catch the ball. And then guess what? He's got to make sure he can turn the corner to go ahead and get his hips turned a certain way to beat him. So many things have to go into play. And then, oh, yeah, we got to line up and do that again. And then we got to do it 10 more times going down the field, nickel and diamond all the way without offensive tackle whiffing on a on a block on a dn he gets in there now sacks the quarterback it's now second and 16 everything's now thrown off you don't not get in a hold not having a false start not having a drop pass not having to be a play where the receiver reads the coverage wrong so now instead of running an eight yard curl he runs a 12 yard curl quarterback's patting the ball because he's ready to throw receiver's not out of his break yet so many things have to go right in that 12 play drive going 80 yards rather than just getting some chunk plays. That's why it's so difficult. That's why a lot of quarterbacks like to go and get those bigger plays because man, so many things have to go right just to go ahead and keep the chains moving on a consistent basis. You have to be so precise because if you get a DB that's aggressive too, and he's going to jump that little three yard in or three yard out, he's housing that probably. Exactly. So that, yeah, so many things have to go right. And I think, uh, I think teams that are, teams are getting smarter and they're playing a little bit more of that bend don't break type of defense. And like I said, man, I, I was enamored by the way Vic Fangio constructed that defense back in 2011, 2012, 2013, and even 2014, but especially 2011, 2012, and 2013, uh, because the way that they would always stone the Green Bay Packers, whether it was at Candlestick or whether it was up there in Lambeau Field, 
it was it I was enamored by it because it was just a very simple coverage but they did not give the downfield passes and you got the pass rush doing their thing so man it, it, it all worked in unison but like I said if you do not have a quarterback who's willing to take the check down because a lot of quarterbacks they don't want to believe they don't want to use this mentality I was always taught this you'll never go broke taking a small profit mm, you never will good point but these quarterbacks, no, they don't want to do that. Like, hey, man, it's 80,000 people in the stands, or it used to before COVID. I'm getting on the highlight <laughs> reel. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, man, like, hey, man, they pay me $40 million a year. Like, hey, man, I need to show my arm off. Right. And, and, that, and that right there is when Eric Harris steps in front of that errant throw at Arrowhead Stadium, picks the ball off, ends the game. Because that quarterback wants to throw that second-level ball mm. or the third-level. It's funny because I really feel like we just described Drew Locke this year. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, i tell you this. I, I, uh, I liked him coming out of Missouri. I took notice of Drew Locke when they played the Texans in 2019 in December, and they were up 38-3 at halftime. That's when I took notice of Drew Locke. I was like, man, this kid right here is making a lot of quarterback throws. Not because he's throwing for a lot of yards, but the very first play of the game, he rolled out on a bootleg, hit no offense on the sideline right here, went for a big play. And then he threw a touchdown in the scene, which was almost kind of in between two uh, uh, Houston defenders, and that was a quarterback throw. Not because he just threw the ball, receiver caught it, but he threw it in a tight window, and it got there. I was like, okay, you know what? Gunslinger, fearless. And then I remember coming into this past 2020 season, man, I really think he's going to surprise a lot of people. But then Corlin Sutton gets hurt, and then everything just kind of goes downhill. But what I noticed about Drew Locke, and I'm not sure if John Elway feels this way, but I think he might based on John Elway being a more of an old school guy. When it was, I think they were playing the Chargers in Denver. And when he started dancing on the sideline, <laughs> I was like, I was like, uh, oh. I was like, there we go. I was like, that's like that, that's like that's it right there. Not because, hey, hey man, football is a game of emotion. You're winning the game, you're playing well, show emotion. You're gonna have fun. But, but the way that he choreographed it, and you could tell the wheels were turning in his mind, like, okay, this is what I saw on the video. So let me make sure that I do it just the right way on the TikTok video. Because you know he got that from somebody. He didn't create that as his himself. But the way that he was making sure that he did it exactly right, I'm like, the game's not over, A. And B, let your receiver or your running back or a DN, you know, do the night, the TikTok dances. Or <laughs> what you know, you just saw the latest rapper do. Like, let them do that. Like, I get it. Show show emotion, please. I love my quarterback showing emotion, but like, leave that more to the skill guy. Like, <laughs> yeah, you, know, you don't you don't have to be the star of it just because you threw it and yeah, like I get it. Spike the ball like Tom Brady. Do the discount double check like uh like Aaron Rodgers <laughs> or you know like Pat Mahomes when they played the Bears. Do the you know go ahead and count like man they really drafted me number ten overall and then this guy right here number two overall like. Do that, but like the whole little TikTok. I was, when I saw that, I'm like, okay, and 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 sure enough, like my boy Colin Coward got him the next day yeah, on, uh, yeah. on the herd. Oh yeah. But so so when I saw that, and then when he came back and fired back at Colin Coward, when he said, I mean, I guess he should get used to it because it's probably not going to stop. When I saw that, I'm like, okay, I see a little bit of maturity issues, but mm -hmm. you know, also. That's this new generation. That's the new age player. So you also got to kind of understand that that's the new wave. You know, um, you can't completely have the old school mentality of, you know, quarterbacks got to act like this. They can't act any other way. So, you know, can't I can't have it, the hat backwards. Remember, yeah. Pop Coward said, <laughs> can't have the hat backwards. Uh, but no, I, but um, I, I like Locke. I, I like him. I think he's got to settle down. And he's got to he's got to hone in some of those mistakes because I remember Sunday night game Broncos Chiefs Broncos should have won that game yeah should have won that game but I remember uh, early in the game first drive throws the ball uh, I think he's rolling to his left intercepted by uh, by uh, by a honey badger and I remember thinking to myself 
that's a blown opportunity. Like, you could have at least got a field goal out of that if you really, really want to win this game, even though it's a first drive. But it's those mistakes that he can't make. And I think that me being 30, now 37, I don't want to sound like the old guy in the room, but I have to believe that the dancing like the TikTok, the hat backwards, the – well, I hope he, you know, gets used to it because it's probably not going to stop as far as my dancing on the sideline. I have to think that some of that mentality leads to the decision-making of throwing the ball to the other team rather than running out of bounds, throwing it out of bounds, things like that. Um, so, you know, uh, but but I, I like his ability. I like the fact that he's fearless. I just think he's got he's to go ahead and uh, and really cut down on – making the smarter play, not just, oh, I'm going to beat it with my arm because, you know, I got a cannon for it. Uh, yeah. I think if he does that, man, I think Denver with Judy, with uh, my man Cortland Sutton, and then Gordon and, uh, uh, gosh, uh, Lindsey in the back end, and then the way Bowles has come on as the left tackle, made all pro yeah, today. That, that was yeah. That was the biggest shocker of the season yeah. for Denver, yeah. for sure. And, and, I think, uh, and I think already, man, Vic Fangio – Man, he can coordinate the defense, man. They're like that's already been well proven. Um, and then you know, getting you getting your boy uh, Simmons locked up. I think that um, I think now I think I think the Broncos, man. I think they'll be they'll be a player uh, within the AFC, no doubt. I, I think that's the one thing we can't do is lose Justin. Yeah, I, yeah, I man. Just... I like watching him, man. He's a uh, he's a good player, man. Really uh, love the way he plays. He's physical. He's always around the ball, whether it's pass plays or run plays. I really like that. Um, and I mean, like I said, you know, Vic Fangio. I remember when I saw what he did in San Francisco, and then going over to Chicago and all that. Like I've been, I mean, I'm sold on him as far as a defensive mind, no matter what. Yeah, I've I've been pretty harsh on Fangio at points this year because of like his clock management. Yeah, but mm -hmm. his defense. Yeah, you, you can't you can't question that. Exactly. Yeah, I think that uh, I think whenever defensive guys become head coaches, because defensive guys err on the side of caution, where they don't care for the offense running a trick play or taking a shot. You know, defensive players are like, hey, let's run the ball, control the clock, play good defense, and then get the hell out of here. That's where I think that for defensive guys that become head coaches, they have to have somebody, whether it's an assistant or somebody on the sideline to handle the offensive in, uh, uh, intricities that may come up like the nuances simply because, like you just said, clock management. As a defensive player, what the hell are you worried about clock management for on defense? So I think that's where, as a defensive-minded guy, you fall short of those type of nuances that may come late in the game, two-minute drill, things like that. So I think even if you have a defensive-minded head coach who's a former D coordinator, you got to have some sort of offensive mind on that sideline to be, hey, hey, Vic, hey, man, hey, we need to call timeout right here because of A, B, and C. you got to have that. Otherwise, you will have those full bars that he's made this season with the uh, cock management. I actually, uh, Sean sent me a thing earlier. He was voted a uh, Raiders MVP this season. <laughs> yeah, him and him and Greg Williams on the uh, Raiders staffers at you know on the Athletic, they voted on the Raiders MVP, and both Greg Williams and Vic Fangio received half a vote for giving us two more. And, votes. and you know, man, he should he should have been because listen to me very carefully. Um, and I mean, like, in, I mean, maybe the Jets were tanking, maybe they weren't. I don't know, but I know this. I don't know how you're trying to actually win a game by calling an all-out blitz coverage, cover zero, when you have to protect the end zone. Let's say that the let's say the Raiders need a field goal. Okay, I can kind of see why they did that. Right. Raiders are about 10 yards away from being in field goal range. You got to keep them out. I get that. But for having to protect just the end zone, not field goal range, the end zone, and then you do that, oh my lord. Like I remember. If that would have been Namdi or let's say Charles Woodson, hell, even myself, like, yeah, we're having to talk with that D coordinator after that play. <laughs> like, and I mean, shit, and maybe Kirk Morrison, he might have just simply just said, okay, F the D coordinator, F the call, cover two. And just said, F him, 
He can yell at us when we get off the field on the sideline, but at least we'll be getting off the field. We're going to have a win and not a loss. Exactly. He'll be yelling at us while we're in the locker room celebrating the win, not us over here wondering, man, we just got beat on a double move because we ran cover zero against a fast receiver when we didn't have to. So, yeah, I mean, that right there, I mean, he might as well, he should have been the uh, the MVP. Simply (laughs) because, man, like that right there, no, like that's – I can't even fathom a a, a situation – where Where that's okay. And I'm talking about, I don't care if you have Champ Bailey playing the nickel, Darrell Revis outside, and Namdi Asamoah in the other corner, I'm still not even calling all-out blitz. No, you don't do that. No shot. Well, You don't do that. No, it's funny. So, like, the following week, I forgot who it was, but they did the complete opposite. They blitzed no one. And mm-hmm. they just let the quarterback sit back there. And it almost was completed. I was like, I don't think either is the answer. I don't think you blitz yeah. no one, and you definitely don't blitz if, everyone. If you want to blitz, well, just send three. one extra guy, send yeah. five, mm-hmm. drop the rest back. Like, yeah, you, ha- you have to. And I think, But the main thing, man, you, gotta, you have to be on the same page. That's the main thing. Yeah. And I think too much in that back end, they're not on the same page. Like Isaiah Johnson plays corner for the, for the uh, Las Vegas Raiders. On that play – to end the game, the the long play where uh fit where Fitz threw it over Arnett's head right there in the honey hole. Isaiah Johnson was playing safety. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. So like it's too much. It's too much interchange and things like that. You got to have okay. You play corner. You play safety. This is cover two, guys. I I coach high school ball, and it's in cover two. Don't let anybody behind you. Period. I don't care what happens. I don't care if a bomb goes off. I don't care if the lights go out. I don't care if the quarterback pulls down his pants and just uses the restroom on the field. You don't let anybody behind you, period. Like there is no but if and right. this, no, there, it, no, uh-uh. Nobody's behind you, period. And I think that you have to have that type of a mandate. You have to have that type of, of a mentality. And you can clearly see the Chargers game the Dolphins game, the Chiefs game. You can clearly see other games where they don't have that mandate that I'm a cover two safety. My job is to not get let anybody behind me, period. Right. You don't you don't see that you don't see that harsh written in stone, not in ink. You don't see <laughs> that mandate out of the defense. And that's why some weeks they're good, they beat the Chiefs. And then they go against the Falcons and get destroyed. Like without kind of, Julio, get destroyed. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, man, accountability, man, it really has, it really has to come in. It really um, has. Changing gears a little bit, we saw this question earlier today that PFF asked, and we we asked this last year too, and we got a lot of different answers. Uh, they said, if you had a million dollars, who would you rather try and tackle? Derek million dollars on the line. A million Ooh. dollars on the line. Derek Henry or Lamar Jackson? I said Derek Henry because he's gonna run me over i might not walk off the field he might stiff arm you don't like he did uh like he did maybe he four uh, dbs this year i was gonna say just pick a name he does it to everybody (laughs) um maybe he trips over me when he when i fall down a million dollars now uh, before i answer the question is this like oklahoma drill where it's like i'm on the five yard line i got to keep him from getting in the end zone is it like is it a condensed area they didn't specify but let, let's go let's go one-on-one like oklahoma drill oklahoma oh if it's oklahoma drill oh i'm, I'm give me lamar jackson because it's a condensed space it, it is uh, a smaller space and so. i'm not worried about it running me over but even just for the for the open-ended question that that, that pro football focus asked i would choose lamar jackson simply because I know he can't run me over because he's not bigger than me, and Lamar Jackson can't outrun me. Now, is it oh, going to be a is point it going to be a big play? Is he going to get maybe 15, 20, 30 yards? Yeah, but I'm going to I'm going to eventually be able to tackle him. You know, like he's not going to score the touchdown. Um, so if you're asking me, I would choose Lamar Jackson because I know he can't run me over and he can't outrun me. Even though, man, he's he's a phenomenal player, man, MVP of the league. They didn't specify rules, so, you know, maybe I grab a little face mask, horse collar, you know, if I get a hand, maybe, you know, <laughs> taking the shoe off, something. I didn't specify rules, so like, I might get a penalty along the way, but I'll make sure I get them down somehow. <laughs> but, I, man, I can tell you, um, man, I remember this, had, this was maybe about five years ago. I was actually in Miami, Florida, and um, Derrick Henry, this is right when he was coming out of Alabama, and he got on the elevator. 
same elevator I was on. And I was already done playing at the time. So, you know, as a man, we always kind of, you know, size up somebody if they're standing next to us. And I, I remember standing next to him, I'm just like, Lord. I'm like, he's like a defensive end. And this guy's going to be playing running back in the NFL. So I knew then I was like, yeah, he's going to be a monster to bring down. And we clearly see that he's just that. Well, it's like that famous photo of him and uh, Mark Ingram. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I've talked to Mark. And I, I asked him about it. I said, Mark, you know, they kept showing that picture. And he, Mark says that he, it, was a, it was like a little downhill. He was standing further away, so he looked smaller. And I'm like, Mark, he, I, the dude's just a monster. No, he is. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, he is. He's 6'4", like 250. And the thing that I love about Derrick Henry is, and you saw this against the Texans just a couple of days ago. You saw this against the Ravens back earlier in the season. And you saw this against the Texans the first time they played them. Is it – for a lot of running backs, you see the – I'm trying to think here. I love it out of Christian McCaffrey. You see it out of uh, even Dalvin Cook a little bit. But I'm not going to say that Derrick Henry's really fast, but you don't see him get caught much. You don't. No. And I, and I don't know if it's because he's got a long stride or he's really fast. I don't know. But I love how him being as big as he is, he can get through that second wave, and you don't see him being caught. And I think that right there just takes his game to a completely different level because he can run you over, stiff arm you to the ground. Oh, yeah. And if he gets a step on you, it seems like people are struggling to catch him. That's why I think, man, he's – um. He's a total package. And, you know, with a lot of big bruising running backs, like let's say the Jerome Bettis type or like a Ruben Drones, they're not somebody who's elusive once they finally break. But him, he is. So, man, that's I – man, that makes him he, – he's not even great. He's what you call special. Mm -hmm. Real quick before we let you go, I want to know your Super Bowl picks. Who's in the Super Bowl and who you got mm. winning it? Oh, man. Okay, let's go ahead and just kind of go down the list right here. Uh, for one, I'm picking the Colts to beat the Bills tomorrow. That's number oh, one. So JP's um, looking like that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm picking the Colts to beat the Bills. Okay. Uh, I picked the Steelers to uh, drive. They're gonna, I think they're going to drive Cleveland. Um, and then we got uh, – who's the other AFC game? We got – uh, Tennessee, Baltimore. Tennessee Ravens. I'm picking Tennessee over Baltimore, even though if Baltimore wins, I won't be surprised. Uh, it's a tough and, matchup for them, yeah, just personnel wise. Exactly. Style. NFC, I think Bucks are going to win, but I think Washington is going to make it interesting. Yeah. We, uh, we literally said that before we hopped on with you. We were like, I think this game's going to be a lot closer than people yeah, realize. I think just I because think the so teams too. that Tampa struggled against are the ones with the great D lines, exactly. Chicago. Los exactly. Angeles. And what's one thing Washington's got? They get Chase out of that Young, game. Montez Sweat, Jonathan mm -hmm. Allen. Yeah, uh, I think that I think that New Orleans, I'm gonna go ahead and give them the victory over Chicago, but I think Chicago is going to muck it up for them. I I do. Uh Chicago, no matter what, they have a good defense. Trubisky's been playing better. Uh they've been scoring, you know, 30 plus a couple times. Uh I mean, he's clearly not on the level of Drew Brees, but I see Chicago making it very tough on New Orleans yeah. to really go ahead and get that offense going. The other NFC game is, yeah, Seattle, Seattle. and L.A. Yeah. I, uh, I, I pick Seattle. I wouldn't be surprised if L.A. wins, but I'm going to go with Seattle. So uh, then we go to the divisional round. I don't even know what the matchups are going to be. But anyways, I, I would pick uh, – I would have to go with Kansas City because they are the favorites from winning last year. But I would not be surprised if Kansas City does not make it to the playoff uh, to the Super Bowl. I would well, not be surprised who, at all. Who do you have beating them if you have the Bills getting knocked off by the Colts? God, I know, and that's why I just kind of myself <laughs> up. Um, I think I think that if I think if Pittsburgh gets their their crap together, Pittsburgh has the defense with the pass rush. They could muck it up for Kansas City, and I don't see Kansas City being able to hang with their receivers. With Pittsburgh, okay. if their offense puts together a complete game, they're going to exactly. be tough to beat just because yeah. of the defense. I could see so. Pitts. I could see Pittsburgh doing it. Um, I could even see the Colts sneaking them. Not, it's not something that high probability, but I could see it by Eberflus's, uh defense, and they're not going to have an answer for T.Y. Hilton. I mean, I'm sorry, the Chiefs. 
they're Super Bowl champions. I got to give them their respect, but I don't see them being able to stop high-powered offenses in the back end. Um, but like I said, I but I would just go ahead and say the Chiefs represent the AFC because until they're beaten, you got to give them their credit. On the NFC side, um, Seattle, I love them, but I don't think they have enough on defense to stop an Aaron Rodgers type of group. Uh, New Orleans, something about them, I just – they, they're so, going, something about them. They feel like something's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Like something's going to happen with New Orleans. There's they're, no Minnesota they, this year, though, so they don't have to worry about that. <laughs> true. But I, uh, I don't see – I do not see New Orleans going up there to Green Bay winning yeah, the postseason. Winning. Yeah. Uh, Mid-January, I played, in, I played in Lambeau Field twice in December. Against, once against Brett Favre, once against Aaron Rodgers. Man, that's a different type of place to play. And – being a dome team going to go play out in the cold, man, that's different. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, so that's going to be a big one. I would probably, I mean, I'd probably go Green Bay out of the NFC. Even What's though your favorites? Would, yeah. <laughs> um, but I would not be surprised. I think you have a better chance of Green Bay getting there than Kansas City. I don't know why. I don't know why, but the Denver game, both Raider games. Miami game, um, and it was another game. Kansas City, Atlanta. They almost lost to Atlanta last exactly week. Exactly. Like, yeah. I don't care what anybody says. Oh, you know, they know how to turn it on and off like a light switch. Mm. They're and not LeBron it, James here. Exactly. And, <laughs> and this right here, when was the last time Pat Mahomes played for the Chiefs? When was the last time? Week 16. Yeah, it's three weeks by the time they play. They didn't play against. They didn't play against. Um, against who was it? Chargers. Chargers. Yeah. And they got a bye week this weekend. It's gonna be three weeks in between snaps for Pat Mahomes and a lot of their you know top notch players. That right there means a lot in in football. It does. Doesn't mean that you. It doesn't mean that you're not a good team anymore. But you're gonna have a little bit of that rust on you. And if they mess around here and they and they uh and they open up with uh Steelers, whatever they, they could they'd open up with either Baltimore, uh, the Colts, or or the the Browns. And I could def yeah. and I could definitely see Baltimore smacking them in the first quarter and them taking a whole half to kind of get their bearing. I could definitely see that. And Baltimore, they get up on you. That's going to be tough on you because they'll run the ball, drown out the clock, and Baltimore got them hogs up front where they can get after the quarterback. Marcus Peters, he loves taking chances, stealing that ball. Yeah. Marlon Humphrey, steady. Doesn't get a lot of interceptions, but he's always there. Make pass breakups. If you do catch it, he's great at punching the ball out, things like that. So uh, the Chiefs, as great as they are, because it seems like they struggle in the red zone, they struggled against the Raiders, struggled against the Broncos, struggled against the Falcons, struggled against the Dolphins, things like that. That to me, that, that means something because man, like when you're around that December part of the season, that's when you really got to be hitting stride. Like you see what Green Bay is doing. I don't know whether it was just him and Matt LaFleur finally getting on the same page. I don't know it was the, the draft pick of Jordan Love and that pissed him off. I don't know what happened. <laughs> but man, I tell you this, Green Bay, Jair Alexander going to the Pro Bowl. You got uh my man uh Zadarius Smith. I think he got a Pro Bowl nod today as well. Um you could tell Green Bay, they're looking like they're really rounding in the form at the right time. And Kansas City, even though they're 15 and 1, I'm sorry, or 14, 14 and 2. 14 and 2. Yeah, yeah, 14 and 2. They just seem like they're not really firing off of all cylinders. They had a lot of close games down the stretch. Exactly. And I and I think for Pat Mahomes being as great as he is, having Tariq Hill, best receiver in the league, Travis Kelsey, record-breaking tight end, best offensive mind, Andy Reid, best offensive coordinator, and Eric B. Enemy, all of that, why the hell are you 17-14 against the Falcons? Yeah, that was like, a good point. Why the hell like why the hell does that happen? Why Unless are they're you bored. Up, <laughs> Why are you up 28-10 against the Dolphins? You're up 28-10 against the Dolphins. I'm like, okay, sure, I can go ahead and, you know, go to another game. And then all, all of right. a sudden, Miami starts getting back in this game. Like the Denver Broncos, they should they should have lost to Denver on that Sunday night game. I was rooting for Denver. They should have <laughs> lost that game. Yeah, that um, first one was tough. Yeah, like, and, and Denver is really doing a great job in the red zone 
of stopping them and forcing them to field goals. If you got the best quarterback, best offensive mind, best offensive coordinator, best tight end, best receiver, all of that working for you, you shouldn't be getting stalled like that in the uh, in the red, the red zone, zone, man. You, you shouldn't. But like I said, you know, that's why it's the playoffs. Remains to be seen. I think it's going to be a great weekend. But uh, I would not be surprised if Green Bay and Kansas City are not meeting. But I got a little bit more faith in Green Bay than, uh, than Kansas City. So, making so you that. got Green Bay beating Kansas City in the Super Bowl? Is that what you're saying? Uh, if they were to play in the Super Bowl, uh, yeah, I would go with Green Bay over uh, – over Ooh. over Kansas City because I think Green Bay is a little bit more well rounded. I think that Aaron Rodgers, stud quarterback, we all know that. If there's a quarterback that has more physical gifts in NFL history, it would be Pat Mahomes. But Aaron Jones, that to me right there would be the difference. And you got those bookends. You got Preston Smith, Darius Smith. You got Frank Clark and uh, and Chris Jones for Kansas City. But I think that I think Green Bay has a better defense all okay. around than I would go with Kansas City. But like I said, you know, um, that remains to be seen. But that would be my picks. But do not be surprised if Kansas City does not make it back. Do so you, not be surprised. Yeah. So you heard it here first then. If you, you need to put money down, <laughs> put it down on Green Bay. There, there it is. <laughs> My, well, my uh, bill, I have money on the Bills. I went out the window real quick here, Stanford. Tell me they're going <laughs> to lose tomorrow. Jesus. <laughs> no, it, but this is, this is why I really love that defense of Indianapolis. I remember a couple years ago they blanked the Houston Texans, Deshaun Watson, uh, in the wild card round because they made him throw the check downs. Yeah. Like, I, like I told you before, Josh Allen, I remember last year, they're playing the uh, Houston Texans right down here in Houston. They're up 16-0. They're supposed to walk off with the victory. Second half comes around. Deshaun Watson starts balling. And there was points in that game where Josh Allen, all he had to do was just make a few completions, move the chains, drown out the clock. You can ride out with the victory. And he didn't do that. This year, MVP candidate. We all can see that. Made all pro today. Much respect. Now we're getting to the playoffs. So now we're getting against teams that, okay, they know what they're doing. They know how to take away your right hand. Can you win this game left-handed? So because I haven't seen it in the playoffs, same thing why I'm picking Tennessee over Baltimore with Lamar Jackson, I got to see you do it in the playoffs because that's more so when it counts. That's why I would pick the Colts over the Bills because I got to see you now do this in the postseason, not just you go 13-3, and three, the Tom Brady-less New England Patriots, you're able to win the AFC East, but can you now do this against a team that's going to force you to play with your left hand? And right. Justin Houston, DeForest Buckner, um, there's other guys in that D line to get out the quarterback as well. My man Darius Leonard in the uh, the Mike linebacker in the middle. You got Kenny Moore. Oh, they're loaded. Anthony Walker, DeForest Buckner, exactly. Xavier Rhodes having a hell of a bounce back season. Exactly. So, will they be able to slow down the Buffalo Bills offense? I think they can. Phillip Rivers played against him for so many years in the AFC West. Phillip Rivers is a really good quarterback. Now he's a statue. He can't run. He can't move. You get him off the spot. You'll easily beat them. Who's going to stop Indy's offense? I get it. Tredavious White, stud corner, man. Should have made all pro this year, in my opinion. But, well, no, he did. He made second team. Felt, yeah. like, he, felt like he probably should have made first team, but whatever. Great, great player. Um, he can go ahead and he can man up on T.Y. Hilton. The other guys, are they going to be able to stop? Who was it? Uh, Burton. And uh, uh, I forget the names of the other receivers. And then uh, my man. man. Yeah, my man, uh, the running back. Uh, you got Hines, Taylor, Hines. You got Himes and Taylor. I like that duo. So uh, so it's really going to be interesting. But I would not be surprised. I'm telling you guys, don't be surprised the Colts sneak the Bills. Do not be surprised. Hmm. I'm telling well, you Well, that right was now. my Super Bowl pick, so I hope you're wrong. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> same here. I got, I got money on Buffalo. I, I'd really like for them to win the Super Bowl. That'd be really I mean, nice. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I think I think Buffalo is a great team. Um, I still, like I said, I love the I love the change, or should I say, I love the maturation that Josh Allen has shown this year because I was not a believer of him as far as accuracy and actually being able to make quarterback throws. Mm -hmm. I really, really wasn't. But that's changed a lot of my mind this year. It really, really has. Now I just want to see can he do it in the postseason because it's a different animal. 
regular season, September through December, and now January, because now the teams are scheming against you. There is no tomorrow. It's real easy to, okay, you know what? We got a, uh, we got the Bills this week, but then we got the Chiefs right after. So sometimes you kind of, okay, well, you know, let me pay a little bit closer attention to the Chiefs than I would the Bills because we got to make sure that we win certain games for seeding and this, that, and the other. In the playoffs, there is no, there is no Sunday for the Indianapolis Colts. So there is nobody that you got to worry about the week after, anything like that. So it's right. all about the Bills for the Indianapolis Colts and for every other team that's playing in the playoffs. You don't have to – there's none of that looking ahead – there's none of that in the playoffs. It's about, okay, I got to take away your right hand. And that's one thing the teams will do in the playoffs because that's what it's all about. So it's all about adjusting. So is Josh Allen going to be able to be successful throwing to Beasley? Throwing to, I don't even know who the other receiver is, the other target is uh, for the Bills uh, right off the top of my head. But that's who they're going to have guy. to that's what they're going to have to make sure. Isaiah they, McKenzie, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He, man, he had a re, he had a really good game uh, last, last week, week against, yeah. against yeah, the Dolphins. Yeah, week Dolphin. seventeen. Yep. Yeah, so uh, so he's he's going to have to come up big because I would imagine Eberflus is going to make sure that we roll the coverage, we take away a Stephon Diggs, much like last year. You, uh, I'm sorry, two years ago when the Colts took away a lot of DeAndre Hopkins from uh, Deshaun Watson. That's where they were able to blank the Houston Texans like that. So I always look at those intricate types of matchups, the offensive coordinator versus the D coordinator, vice versa, things like that. Whenever I'm thinking about, okay, this team is playing this team in the playoffs. I try to think more about the matchups of the, uh, of the, the coordinators and how they actually make sure to attack certain weaknesses, whether it's on offensive or defense side of the ball. I, I think it's going to be the best game of the weekend, not just from a, yeah. player personnel standpoint but coaching as well yeah I think so too that's why like I'm telling you man um I would not be surprised I think the Bills are a great team they're a phenomenal team but like I said in the playoffs the better team doesn't always win it's the better team on that Saturday or that Sunday that's why uh yeah. that's why that's why like I said I wouldn't be surprised and Philip Rivers he has more experience than Josh Allen Philip Rivers ain't never won no Super Bowl but Philip Rivers, he has more playoff experience on how to get over that hump, at least get into the AFC title game than uh, than Josh Allen does. I just hope we don't see another Josh Allen lateral like we did last <laughs> year. And, 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 and I'm glad you brought that up. That's why I'm still kind of hesitant, okay, on just, okay, the Bills are the best team. They're going to make it to the AFC title game. They might win the Super Bowl. That's why I'm still kind of like a little bit hesitant because I, I, I live in Houston. I remember watching that game, and I remember thinking to myself, why in the hell did he just do that? It wasn't <laughs> even like it was the last play of the game. Yeah. Like, why it's the so hell did bad. he just do this? So things like that still stick out in the back of my mind. But nonetheless, man, uh, uh, the kid had an MVP season, won't win the MVP award, but definitely was third best when it comes to having an MVP season, all pro, pro bowl, definitely turned around and uh, had a great year. Uh, Stephon Diggs, man, I think that was a great trade for them. Uh, one of the few times in NFL history where it seems like both teams – The return is benefit immediately. Yeah, yeah from, from the trade. But nonetheless, like I said, man, Josh Allen, he's got an extremely bright future in this league no matter what. Uh, Stanford, do you have anything you want to plug? Oh, uh, man, uh, I guess, uh, man, uh, I guess my, my own podcast, uh, All Facts, No Cap, it's, uh, I, I upload a lot of the, uh, the videos on my page at SROUT26. Um, I guess that's pretty much about it, man. I love following you guys' page, man. I like, y'all got so, I've gotten in so many heated <laughs> discussions, debates, whatever, on some of you guys' posts whenever I comment, you know, I got like 15 oh, people firing back at me. Uh, man, like I, I, I love following you guys' page. Um, I love how you'll post a quote or post, let's say, one of those stats where you got a comparison between guy A and B, yeah. and they're, you know, the, and their their picture is blacked out, yeah, and then, then, when you, then swipe, you see who it is. Yeah, um, I, I love that. I, I love the debates about you know the the corner who gets a lot of interceptions versus the one who just uh, gets a lot of pass breakups, things like that. Man, I, I love you guys' page. So man, like. <laughs> Much love Appreciate to you. That. Uh, yeah, like, trust me, there's plenty of times, man. Y'all give me some t anxiety sometimes because I know <laughs> – 
when I make a comment, <laughs> I know that somebody's going to say something. Something's going to come back. Yeah. So then when I so then when I get the notification about about somebody uh, replying to, I'm like, oh, I'm like, okay, like either, here we go. And, yeah, like here it goes. Here and here then I'm like, so th there's times where like, okay, I know I just commented on their page. Like I'll go and put my phone on the other side of the room because <laughs> I know it's coming back. And there's often times. Oh, yeah. And oftentimes, depending on who it is responding or what they say, I know that I got to be in a certain headspace. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to, <laughs> to, be able to, to be able to go back and forth because it'll be something like, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, dude. You play for the Raiders. And then I'm like, okay. I'm like, okay, I, I got to go into asinine uh, mode. And, you know, I got I, I to gotta be in the right frame of mind to be an asshole these days, man. Yeah. Like, so, yeah, but but nonetheless, man, like, I love following you guys' page, man. I love that. I'll make oh, sure we, to we link definitely appreciate your podcast. <laughs> yeah, we definitely appreciate that. I'll make sure to link oh, your good, podcast man. as well. Cool, um, cool. Quick, uh, let, me, let me get a real big shout out to Fabe, yeah. though, because I think yeah. Fabe's the reason you found us, I think. Yes, right? it, it actually is. Fabe, man, no, that's my boy. We've been, we've been boys ever since we first got drafted in Oakland, man. But, yeah, I love, uh, like I said, I found, your, found you guys' page from him. And man, I've been following it ever since. Uh, I love it. There's times where, like, um, even yeah, even today, the whole thing about Deshaun Watson, they didn't con they didn't consult oh. with him. Like, I wanted to comment, but I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, man, I, I better I'm leave like, that one. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't want the smoke today. But I'll tell you this. Uh, I'll, I'll go and leave you guys with this. I understand why he's upset. I get it. I know how the Houston Texans are ran, and believe me. It is a we're front office. You play the you play football. You throw the touchdowns. Leave us to the deciding of the front office. It is a separation of church and state over there uh, in that building. That's number one. Number two, I think that you got to really step back and look at this. And I think for Deshaun Watson, obviously he feels disrespected because they didn't include him in the GM search process. I get that. I think. They gave him a monstrous contract. And believe me, he's worth every penny and then some. But they gave him that contract with about five years still under their control, where they could have played hardball with him, let him play out his rookie deal, franchise him three times like Washington did with Kirk Cousins, yeah. and just simply did that, like what Dallas is doing with Dak Prescott. They didn't do that. They gave you a record-breaking contract after your third year. Didn't mix words with you, didn't play hardball, gave it to you. Now – I'm not going to credit the Houston Texans for actually recognizing his talent. Everybody can see that. But they gave it to him when they could have simply played hardball and been like, you know what? We'll discuss that in your fifth year. We'll discuss yeah, I was that say later. They could have done what right? the Cowboys did. Look what they exactly, did with Dak. Exactly. They could have. So I think by them doing that shows that they recognize your value. They recognize how great of a player you are. Now, Tom Brady didn't have say-so in – the roster, things like that going on the team with the New England Patriots. He didn't have say so. The Green Bay Packers didn't retain Aaron Rodgers, quarterback coach. They cut Jordy Nelson. They drafted <laughs> Jordan Love. They without drafted his replacement before they with, drafted him help. Yeah. Without <laughs> consulting him. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers, Super Bowl champion, probably win the MVP. I think he, this will be his third one, I think. Yeah. Tom Brady, six Super Bowl rings. I mean, come on, good Lord. So when you look at how other quarterbacks don't have say-so in the things that go on on that team, head coaching search, uh, GM search, things like that, that's when you kind of, okay, if they don't have say-so, I shouldn't feel as disrespected because I didn't have say so. Right. Now, if other, if other quarterbacks are able to go and sit in the meeting room and actually give their input, then okay, you know what? I think we have a little bit more of an argument. Um, but I think that I, I, that's how I view that now. According to what I read, if Calvin McNair actually really truthfully said, hey, uh, you're going to have input on the GM or the head coaching uh, hires, and then it turns around that he didn't give that to him. Oh my God! Then oh, by all oh yeah. Means, if you if you tell me one thing and then I don't get it, it then. yeah, by all means. But if that wasn't the exact case, then I mean, I see why he's I see why he would be upset because I mean I would be upset too. Yeah. But 
Do I necessarily have like a leg to stand on as far as demanding a trade? I think that's a little bit, uh, I think that's taking a little bit too far because if both 12s, number 12 for New England, now for Tampa Bay, and number 12 for Green Bay, if they don't have say so, yeah, who's why do you, you do? Why yeah. do you feel why do you feel that you should emphatically have say so? But like I said, nonetheless, I hear so many different kind of stories and reports or whatever. I'm not really sure, but uh, but that's that's my take on it. But if they told him, hey, you're gonna have uh you're gonna have an actual voice on who we choose as the GM and the head coach, and they just simply were like, Oh, F you, we're doing this. Oh yeah, by all means, like you can't lie to me. But for me, expecting to have something that you didn't exactly emphatically definitively agree to, then that's more on me kind of being in my feelings than on that being something that, okay, you know what, all quarterbacks have say so on their team about the personnel, which we all know is not the case. Then you have to also uh, remind yourself that, okay, I know the team respects me because of what they did for me at the time they did it. Right. You have to understand, okay, I'm also just the quarterback. I'm not, the not guy the writing, I'm not the guy writing the checks. Yeah, they pay me $40 million a year, but the owner would literally sneeze at that <laughs> if he looked up and saw that was all that was in his bank account. Right. <laughs> you see what I'm right. saying? So, so owners look at things vastly different than players do simply because, you know, they're wealthy, like lineage, generational, like – five, six generations down the line. <laughs> Billions like, of dollars. <laughs> exactly. Like it's a, it's a completely different level of wealth for a owner rather yeah, than a player. a player. Uh, but, but nonetheless, like I said, man, uh, I think the world of the kid, uh, I love what everything he's done for the team and this city. And I think that once he gets the right system, once he gets the right players around him, I think, man, like the sky's the limit because he's my pick for best young quarterback outside of Pat Mahomes in the game because he's mobile, he can run, but he doesn't run to get the first down. He runs to scramble to find the open receiver. And he's the one quarterback outside of Pat Mahomes, who's who's also young. He's mobile, but he's also accurate. You see a lot of other quarterbacks, they're mobile, not as accurate. Other quarterbacks are accurate, but they're not mobile. He's literally right there uh, spit smack dab in the middle that he can do both and that's what i love about the kid so like i said much love to him but yeah if um if it's a situation where they didn't exactly tell him verbatim hey you're gonna have a hand in this then i think that's probably more about being in being in your feelings than actually having a valid gripe as far as wanting and demanding the trade with that being said, Derek Carr and two first, easy deal. It's done, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, you're right. I don't think I don't think it would happen, but uh, but hey, but no, trust me, he would definitely get a king's ransom of picks, no matter what, because man, outside of the Chiefs, uh, for right now in this specific moment, the Bucks and the Bills, um, there aren't many teams that would not entertain. Yeah that trade scenario just because I think how great he is, man. And I think the sky is the limit because he's only going to get better. Man, if somehow that happened and he went to you guys and I had to deal with Pat Mahomes, Deshaun Watson, and Justin and, Herbert and Herbert, yeah. a year, I might turn in my card. I don't know. I, yeah. Man, I'm, it, it, that's what this league is all about now, man, quarterbacks. Like, if you don't have a quarterback, it's like you just don't have a chance. I mean, yeah. I, I like Locke. I just think he has to grow up, and I think he's got to he's got to get out of that Juju Smith Schuster type mentality <laughs> where I'm gonna be me, and everybody else just needs to go ahead and accept it. I think he's got to get out of that mentality and take on a little bit more of a John Elway type of approach, and I think he'll be fine. I really, really do. And I mean, you look at Justin Herbert, you look at his demeanor on the field. I like that demeanor on the field. And I think, I think Locke has what Herbert has as far as talent. I do. I think some of his mind gets in the way of that as far mm. as decision-making, things like that. But I don't see there being any throw Herbert can make that Locke can't. Maybe I'm a little bit naive on that. Maybe I ain't seen enough or whatever. But I don't see Locke as being physically inferior to, like, the top-notch arm-talented quarterbacks in the league. 
Well, Stanford, thank you so much for coming on. I'm so glad we made this happen finally. Um, Hopefully the Raiders are good next year and I could have (laughs) some live streams we talk about them. (laughs) Yeah, fellas. Hopefully not too good. (laughs) Fellas, I'll tell you like this, man. Anything you ever need, let's say like uh, you want to get a quote from me about whatever. Uh, Hey, Ralph, what do you think about you know, the Green Bay Packers offense versus the Kansas City Chiefs defense. Man, like, anything you need, man, just let me know. I'll, I'll gladly hop on with you guys or the IG Live or, you know, whatever, yeah. man. Just go ahead. Just kind of yeah. give me like, Now that we up. got this going, too, man, I mean, we'll, we'll talk more in the offseason for yeah. sure. Maybe Reoccurring guests. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All good, man. Yeah, so, like, anything you need, whether it's the IG Live or this right here, the Zoom shit, man, like, hey, man, feel free, man. Just go ahead and reach out. Y'all got my number. Uh, man, yeah. just go ahead and holler at me. Awesome. No, thank you again. And make sure to check out your, what's the name of your podcast again? Make sure people so check that all out. Fa- all facts, no cap. All facts, no cap. I like yeah, that. It's on, it's on my Instagram page, SRoute26. You'll see it. Yeah, check it out, guys. Thank you again, Stanford, so much. All good, man. All good. Happy to do it.